Hello, and welcome to the Millennial Nutritionist Podcast. I'm Isla Garcia, Master's Degree of Nutrition Science and Registered Dietitian, and I'm going to make weight loss realistic, sustainable, and uncomplicated for your busy lifestyle. On this podcast, me and my team of registered dietitians will decipher the latest nutrition research, dissect fad diets, and discuss social media trends for you so you can feel confident knowing what to eat to achieve your health goals. Research suggests that most weight loss programs aren't successful, but my experience has taught me that this is not because the participants aren't committed. It's because those diets are designed by non-nutrition professionals and center around severe restrictions. We are here to provide the facts about the science of weight loss so you can have the success you want and continue living your best life. It's our first podcast episode of July, which means we're switching to a new focus for the next 30-ish days over the course of this month. We are going to focus over on millennial living about de-stressing. Stress can negatively impact your weight loss for so many reasons, whether it's from being too stressed out about cooking and then just giving up and ordering a pizza, stress eating a whole bag of chips after a long day, or stressing your body out internally with all that extra cortisol going on maybe from something like excess cardio. In order to have successful weight loss, you really do need to reduce your stress. And I know, I know it's way easier said than done, especially as I'm trying to not stress over having a crazy workload of trying to force all my whole week in two days before I leave for my big summer Euro trip. But I'm bringing on another dietitian friend today to talk about how stress can impact your body and give some practical solutions on how to reduce stress both internally and externally. Externally. Kirsten Draney and I go way back to meeting for the first time on an airplane from a nutrition conference. I believe when I was in grad school, we chatted the whole way back about our passion for nutrition, and ever since, we've kept in touch and even worked together in a hospital at one point. Kirsten now has her own private practice called Keeks & Co. and often works with clients who have autoimmune disorders, which is why stress management is so important to her. Typically, people with autoimmune disorders are more sensitive to stress and inflammation and will have a difficult time reaching their health goals if this area of their life is not well managed. In today's episode, Kirsten and I first talk about Gwyneth Paltrow's recent podcast interview where she talks about how she's reducing inflammation in her own body through intermittent fasting and bone broth. But then we go on to talk about how inflammation from stress can impact metabolism, what happens if you never reduce your stress, and what diet is best for reducing inflammation, and her top tips for re- top tips for reducing stress as a bunny busy millennial mom and business owner herself. If you feel like you need more help with reducing stress, make sure to go sign up for Millennial Living, our membership program with either the link in the description box on YouTube or show notes on podcasting to watch a video module that I just uploaded about three habits you should not stress about when you're trying to lose weight. Hint, one is eating late at night. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Kirsten. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you today, Isla? Good. How was the weather down there in North Carolina? Is it super hot? Not quite yet. It was actually a little bit cooler this morning, which like I woke up and I was chilly, which uh, hasn't happened in a while. But if you remember North Carolina weather, it can be very up and down. Yes. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Goodness. We are finally like hitting our hundred degree days out here in Texas. I mean, it's different. People out here are like, it's humid. I'm like, it is not as humid in North Carolina. (laughs) Wow. hundred degree. That is insane. Yeah, yeah. Not experiencing that here at all whatsoever. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, okay. Well, I like to ask everybody so we can kind of get to know you a little bit. Um, are you currently in any new foods or wellness things that can inspire other people so they don't have to keep hearing my little three things that I say all the time? <laughs> yes. Um, as a dietitian myself, I love more than anything, like my silly little wellness rituals. I feel like I always have, I don't know, something that I go to that excites me um, because food is meant to be exciting, of course. Um, by no means am I an expert on European culture. I've actually never even been to Europe. I know that you've traveled there uh, quite a bit, so you may be able to talk on this more than I can. Um, but a lot of my brunch girlies are like, into the Aperol spritz, um, like life right now. Um, and the Aperol spritz is like, it's a cocktail obviously, but Aperol is a type of like, um, 
aperitif, aperitif. I can't, I don't know if I'm saying it correctly, um, but it's made in Italy and um, it's like a mixture of like herbs and bitters. Um, I say all of this because I recently have been like enjoying a very small amount of Aperol's like bigger sister Campari, which is um, like another type of aperitif. It's very, very like bitter and strong, but there is some theory that these things like potentially can help with digestion. Um, whether or not that's the case, it makes me feel fancy. Yeah. And I do think that it's been helping like displace my um, ability to have a heavy pour of wine at dinner. So oh, wow. I'll go ahead and I'll do like an ounce of it while I'm preparing my meal. Oh my gosh, it. that's sophisticated. <laughs> yeah, so whether or not it's actually helping my digestion yeah. um, or not, I don't really necessarily know, but it's offsetting. Um, not something that was like a habit, but I just can definitely drink a little extra wine if I pop myself open a bottle. So mm-hmm. I do think that it was helping me um, tweak some of those health goals and enjoy a nice like bitter uh aperitif. Yeah, I was going to ask, what does it taste like? Just straight. It's it's pretty like strong. I mean, I don't really taste like the liquor side of it as oh. much, um, but it has like burnt orange notes to it. Um, I think it's got like a sweetness to it. It depends on the person though. Uh, mm-hmm. I recently went to, um, I, was, I was actually in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I ordered a cocktail with it. And the waitress came up to me and was like, I just want to let you know like what this tastes like. And I was like, oh, like, that's sweet. Cause she thinks that like, <laughs> I don't know, um, that is going to have like a really strong flavor to it, but it definitely is strong. It's very like punchy. Um, but I don't know. It's just, it's, it's what I've been enjoying. And, um, yeah, I definitely f- feel, feel pretty fancy while doing it. Interesting. Just- Interesting. All right. Yeah. We are, we're going to Spain in two weeks and a, week, yeah, a couple years ago. And I was surprised. It reminds me, I, su- I was surprised that they just like drink vermouth straight there, but I think it's different. Yeah. Like, I think it's like the sweeter one, or I don't know, it's something that we don't have here. And, and feel like, everybody always talks about how Europeans like drink so much alcohol and they like are able to maintain a lower weight. But I feel like it's because we, in America, we put all these like extra things like sugars and all these things. And it seems like there, they just kind of drink it straight, which sounds like kind of what you're doing. Yeah, that could be really likely. And I do think that vermouth is in the same category as yeah. the and potentially Aperol. Once again, not like an expert on it, but it, that totally makes sense. So maybe when you're overseas, you can enjoy a little bit and report back. Let me know what you think. Yeah, I'll do some research and see. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, all right. Well, moving on to our pop culture segment. I'm excited to cover this. I've been trying to um, ask our audience if they wanted me to cover it. And then they said no. And now I'm not asking. Asking, I'm just doing it. So <laughs> because I think it's really cool. Well, I mean, I don't think it's cool, but I always think when something like this comes up, it's important to get an expert's opinion on it. So we're right. talking about Gwyneth Paltrow's, um, I guess, podcast she recorded with somebody else. And they she was talking about kind of like generally what she eats. And I don't know if it got taken out of context, but so many people took little sound bites out of it. And so the actual article I'm going to link is from BuzzFeed and it's called Gwyneth Paltrow addressed backlash surrounding her restrictive food habits. And she kind of goes on to try to say like, it's not exactly what she eats. She doesn't always just intermittent fast. She doesn't always just eat bone broth, blah, blah, blah. But there were some things in there that were still for discussion. A lot of what she's saying she does, she tries to decrease inflammation, which is related to what we're talking about today. But what were your initial thoughts kind of reading over that article? Oh, Gwyneth, that was what was going on through my mind. I feel like she is consistently in some sort of pop culture regarding some sort of wellness Mm -hmm. uh, activity or diet that she's been promoting. And I I wasn't shocked to to read over this at all. Um, And yeah, it it, it was interesting because I, I heard two different things when I was reading through the article, right? It was like, from what she was reporting or whatever soundbite was taken from it, it was that she was drinking coffee in the morning and then having bone broth and then just eating a bunch bunch of vegetables. So mm-hmm. like, you know, I hear that and it's like, whoa, like that's, as a dietitian, like that's not enough food. That is not something that um, I think is sustainable, right? Um, and then her her response to the backlash, right, was like, oh, well, that's not always what I'm doing. Um, you know, what me and my doctor discuss are very different. And I was like, okay, well, that's like, that's not what you're explaining right. to your 
audience, right? And that just leads me to to comment about how, like, what is her audience, mm-hmm. right? Like, Gwyneth Paltrow is a celebrity, so she's going to have access to a lot of, you know, maybe specific wellness things, IV drip supplements, um, where maybe like things like this, like in a way supplement, but like the average consumer and person who listens to her podcast or visits her website or is interested in goop doesn't necessarily like know that or have access to those, even those types of things. Um, I have, I have to, I have to just wonder like, why, why is she promoting those types of things? Why is she saying that? Mm -hmm. Um, and only explaining like those snippets. I'd rather hear about like her overall diet, right? She goes on to say and respond to the backlash that like, oh, but that's not always like Mm -hmm. I eat or balance and I eat my French fries. Well, talk about that. That's what I want to hear, right? That balance, that, that, um, that side of the the story is really truly what the average consumer really should be idolizing. And that's what I think celebrities should be talking about more. Um, It's not glamorous. It's not super sexy, but like at the end of the day, the wellness habits that we should be completing and and doing on a day-to-day basis are it, you know? And um, that's where I just... I shake my head because it's it's a it's a it's a bummer that we can't be um more transparent and but I guess those types of things wouldn't necessarily make headlines, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And kind of diving into what she said, just because I know people will like pick apart me like, oh, if Gwyneth does this, then I should do this to look like Gwyneth, right? right? So uh, what about the bone broth piece? Like, uh, what should we use bone broth for? Should it even be used for anything? What do you think about that? Yeah, great question. I don't hate bone broth. I think that a bone broth and all foods like fit in some way. May they be French fries thing or foods that people want to slap an unhealthy category on, or like these super trendy wellness things. I think there is a way to incorporate all of them. Um, I recommend bone broth to the people that I work periodically um, as being a way to get an extra boost of protein in like a savory liquid. Mm. Most conventional or commercial bone broth, usually around one cup is going to be anywhere from like, I think eight to 10 grams of additional protein. Oh, okay. So, So it could be, a, a good swap for soups or stews or what your co- cooking medium is. Um, if you want to, you know, switch to be more lean, you could swap out maybe some of the the oils that you're cooking with for bone broth instead. Um, I think that that is a, is a good just way to get additional protein. And then um, I also like to look at it too when we think of like maybe breakfast or lunches, and that are maybe like protein forward with protein powders or Greek yogurt. A lot of those things tend to be sweet, right? Mm -hmm. So like I think like fruit smoothies with Greek yogurt or peanut butter or maybe like a Greek yogurt parfait. And that just is going to have that like fruity, sweet flavor to it. So bone broth could be another way to add additional protein and it'd be not a sweet option. From an inflammatory standpoint, though, since that is the topic, um, there is some research that does show that uh, bone broth, it's high in minerals and and, and vitamins, and it also has a high amount of glutamine in it, which is a non-essential amino acid. Um, And glutamine has been shown in research to help like soothe the gut lining and potentially help with gut inflammation. Um, So, you know, is that like a cure-all by no means, but can it hurt uh, to enjoy some bone broth and maybe have the benefits of getting in um, some extra glutamine that can potentially uh, decrease gut inflammation? I don't think so. I don't think that would hurt at all. Um, That's my take on bone broth. (laughs) Okay. All right. Yeah. And kind of going with that, um, she's talking about like when this she gave this response, she said she's working on reducing her inflammation from long COVID. As a dietitian who really works with people who have inflammation, do you think that her approach is work or would work? Like, should people who have inflammation do the same thing with the eating paleo, variety of protein, healthy carbs, she says, intermittent fasting? What do you think about that? Yeah, oh, that's a loaded question. Oh. <laughs> For sure. Um, so I think the biggest thing to think about before I even answer that is like, 
where is this inflammation, right? Mm. And that's going to be on like a person to person basis, right? Inflammation is certainly, I think, a, a catch all term or even like diagnosis, if you will, for something that's not um, ideal, right? Mm. Like, oh, this is inflamed, that is inflamed. When at the end of the day, like diabetes and coronary artery disease, um, And a lot of the chronic diseases that we see people being hospitalized for have like a root in some sort of inflammation. Um, And so inflammation is kind of at the basis of that. So um, yeah, in in terms of like how you want to approach inflammation, I think the, the first step is like truly understanding what is inflamed? Um, Mm -hmm. or is it, is it truly inflammation or am I missing out on like a bigger diagnosis that I am calling inflammation instead? Um, and I don't want people to do that. You know, um, I think as this talk of inflammation comes about and, and stress, um, I don't want people to miss out on exploring, uh, deeper issues because it's just inflammation. Mm -hmm. Um, So determining where like it's all coming from and the actual reason behind the inflammation, I think is first Mm -hmm. and then working with a provider to tweak the things that are really going to impact whatever inflammation is really occurring, right? Say it be gut, say it be skin, say it be, um, like upper GI, lower GI, there's, there's a variety of different ways that inflammation can exist and really nailing that down with a dietitian and your medical providers will only help, um, determine what is the best approach. So, um, her, her answer to that is it's, it's, it sounds, I I don't know what kind of inflammation she's really, uh, you know, Uh fighting COVID that also, um, is I think a series of things as well too. Yeah. So I feel like I hear you saying that, um, was find the root of it first, instead of just like jumping on the bandwagon of like doing the bone broth and they're fasting all that stuff. Like first, see if you can get to the root of what it is and treat that. Yeah, exactly. Cause at the end of the day, like once you're able to do that, you may be able to fix your inflammation or any of your ailments with something that's easier than trying everything that Gwyneth Paltrow does that maybe, you know, assisting something that really isn't that root cause. Yeah, no, I like that. Yeah. And I will say that like eating fruits and vegetables and eating like a healthy diet and focusing on that, that's never going to hurt at all. Right. But, you know, in, in the guise of like how Gwyneth was talking about it and, um, it being more restrictive and not necessarily encompassing like the great rich nutrient dense foods that we could be getting in, um, that's kind of like where I think there's that disconnect because that's Mm -hmm. those healthy foods, eating lots of good nourishing things and focusing on a, like an adequate diet is always going to help inflammation. Okay. Yeah. And kind of like going into then the bulk of our um, interview today, I wanted to start off with um, why people would be interested in listening to this podcast. Most people are wanting to lose weight. So does inflammation impact someone's weight loss journey and, or their overall health? Absolutely. Um, and I don't know if you see this a lot of the times with the, the the clientele that you're working with, but I find that it sure can, I think mm-hmm. in a variety of different ways. Um, but as mentioned, you know, we were talking a little bit about finding that root cause and I've always been under the assumption, and this is how my brain works whenever I work with someone is that your anatomy is going to dictate physiology. So mm-hmm you know, what your body is doing, um, and how it's working is ultimately going to manifest in, you know, you being healthy or you being unhealthy. And it's kind of similar to like a lock and a key, right? Um, I think sometimes of like cells as, you know, a lock and maybe some sort of hormones as the key. And if one of those things is say broken or inflamed, it's not going to be able to do its job correctly. Mm -hmm. And I think in any capacity, um, and I see this a lot in any capacity of that happening, um, it could potentially cause a delay in getting to your health goals. Or if we are putting things into place, other issues may arise, um, that if we're not treating that root cause or figuring out why inflammation is existing, um, 
it's like, you know, we're constantly hitting up against a, a brick wall. Um, specifically, inflammation can impact our hunger hormones, right? Um, insulin, um, which is going to help our body, you know, mobilize fat cells and, um, as well as leptin, which is part of the, the hunger cues. Um, and if those guys aren't uh, cooperating and sending messages properly throughout the body, it's totally gonna, gonna, um, sway things, um, in a direction possibly that isn't optimal for the patients that we're working with. Okay. No, that's good. One time I did have a client because have t- asked me this straight up and I was like, I actually never thought about it because she, she had PCOS and having a little difficulty losing weight. I was like, you know what? You might have some underlying inflammation. It might be keeping you from being able to lose weight. And uh, she was a medical provider. She's like, okay, but what kind of inflammation? Can you explain to me what that means? I'm like, I actually don't know how to explain this. And I think that's a really good <laughs> way to go about saying it. Um, yeah, yeah. And that's kind of where it like teeter totters on our scope and why I do think it's important to like, you know, call in a a medical professional to address really what's going on, like working with other doctors, or at least having the client or patient that you're working with be aware of like, what is what what that root cause may potentially be. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, diet and lifestyle is definitely going to be complementary of that. Can we um, also, before we dig in, define inflammation versus stress? When I was kind of thinking about this and like reading questions, I I was thinking, I think I have, my mind was thinking about kind of two ways, like internal inflammation and or stress and then external stress that might cause internal stress. So can you talk about what that's going to mean for you as we kind of go forward? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's kind of like very cyclical. So mm-hmm. let, let's see, let's define um, stress first. So stress can cause inflammation, right? But then mm-hmm. yes, inflammation in the body can then cause stress and mm-hmm. then it causes more inflammation. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of this, uh, this cyclical type of activity, but inflammation itself is actually like the body's um, type of mechanical response that is natural and actually really good. Right. So mm-hmm. if you think of like a bug bite, right. Um, your body will have acute inflammation, um, a mosquito bite, right? It gets like red and puffy and that's good because it's like telling you like, oh, hey, uh, we helped you, uh, assist a foreign invader from like not poisoning you in a, in a way. Right. Um, and so the body has adapted to have this type of response for protection. So that's that acute inflammation, but a lot of the chronic diseases that we see day to day um, and what I work with, and I'm sure you've worked with, um, is individuals who are undergoing a lot of chronic inflammation. So that's almost as if like, okay, maybe you got a bug bite and it didn't heal all the way. And then you got another bug bite and we just consistently got a lot of bug bites and they're just not healing. Mm -hmm. And maybe it's like day five of the healing of the bug bite, but it's still there and then you have to think, right, that anatomy is going to dictate the physiology. So if if something is just constantly being um, stressed and not working appropriately, other functions of the body are going to kind of fall off. Um, so it, it's interesting because that, that, you know, the basis of inflammation is good, but mm-hmm. the way that we're experiencing it in society nowadays, um, we're seeing more of this, these chronic stressors just underlying. And then it just, it, it, it that, that cycle keeps going and it piles up and that's where we see over time, it really impacting people. Um, so That's what inflammation is. And then when we look at stress, yeah, stress is something that is potentially causing that inflammation to happen. Mm -hmm. Stressors, like you said, environmental stressors, and then potentially even like internal stressors. May that Mm -hmm. be infection, autoimmunity, um, recurrent infections, um, and then even the way that we stress ourselves out, you know, mentally, right? So, um, how our mind reacts to the things around us and um, anxiety, depression, mood, um, those can be stressors as well too. So quite, quite a big, um, a a big definition for both of those things. How would somebody know if they had inflammation? Like if they're listening and they're like, I don't even know if I have it or not. What, what, how would somebody know? 
I think that really comes down to like the the root cause. I think that there is a lot of chronic inflammation shows up um, in ailments that like are just like kind of annoying mm. throughout like your day to day life. Like maybe fatigue, some oh. aches and pains, um, maybe some difficulty in losing some weight. Right. Mm. A lot of the times, like, and this can be sometimes acute and sometimes chronic um, digestive issues, right? If they last a while, right? If it's not like, oh gosh, I, you know, ate something bad and I kind of responded, oh, this is like happening over the course of months, if not years. Um, it's it's like an, an annoyance that's really not like putting you out, but impacting your quality of life of life enough to uh, be spoken about. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And so the next question I had was like, how would stress and inflammation impact your body metabolism? Is it kind of like what you just said or is that different? Yeah, I really, I really do think, I mean, that anatomy and physiology aspect of it, like if, if something is inflamed, it's not going to work its best and it can, it can impact a whole host of cellular components, hormonal components. And then like, it can lead to these bigger, these bigger things. Um, it kind of it kind of sucks, right? Because I feel like a lot of the times I have people who come to me, right, and they're like, "Well, I'm just like so tired, or I, you know, I can't lose this weight," and you know, I, I I hate being like the bearer of bad news, but I'm like, oh man, like we need to focus on these other like lifestyle things that will bring stress down, that will bring inflammation down, because all of these things are actually impacting you on a biological level, right? Like mm-hmm. I mentioned, like, you know, how insulin and, and leptin, those are like two hormones in particular that can totally be impacted with stress and inflammation, but those are really key in weight loss. So it's, it's looking at it and saying, okay, like I, there, there's so much that like, it's just hard. Like people think it's a them thing, right? People wow. think, oh, it's, I'm, it's my fault, right? Like I don't have enough willpower. I don't have this. And maybe it's like focusing on these other things that bring down chronic inflammation that bring down, um, stressors in life could help bridge that gap. Mm, Okay. What about for somebody who has an autoimmune or hormonal condition like PCOS or PCOS, hyperthyroidism, endometriosis, stuff like that is what I commonly see. You probably see more. Um, how would inflammation or stress impact people with these conditions? So a lot of the times, and this is really unfortunate, and I'm I'm right there with everyone who may have one of these diagnoses because I have an autoimmune disorder, um, and it's really irritating. But autoimmune disorders, in and of themselves, are inflammatory types of conditions, right? Because it's your body attacking itself, thinking mm-hmm. that it's you know and, uh, helping you, um, and it's a little bit of a miswiring that's happening. So when autoimmune diseases are flared or um, pertinent and like, you know, you're dealing with some of those symptoms that in and of itself is going to be a stressor. Um, so that, and same thing with hormonal issues as well too. Um, that's actually part of it. I don't know if the research or my knowledge of it is as extensive as how autoimmune issues are impacting, um, like stressors and inflammation, but I do know that that is, that there is relationship to it. Um, I will also say too, that individuals who have autoimmune disorders, um, or have hormonal issues, their needs for nutrition tend to be higher at baseline, right? Because their body is potentially working overtime. We have more inflammation to deal with. Um, and that's kind of like our baseline. And so when you think about like how they have to approach life, um, I think they have to be more intentional and conscious about, um, not only getting in the right type of nutrition, getting in the right type of exercise, um, but also making sure that we're doing everything that we can to control the stressors that we have in our life because our internal our internal stressors are a little bit haywire. What happens if you never resolve or work on your stress? Like if you're like, well, this is just too much and I like working and all this stuff, like what what would that look like for the rest of their life? Yeah. Well, the first thing that comes to mind is you're probably going to feel awful, (laughs) which, you know, I don't want anyone to feel awful. So that's like the the first thing, like, um, I want everyone to eat, live and flourish. And if there is something that is consistently making you feel awful, like let's get that out of the way. Um, and a lot of the times those come with stressors, but right. If that chronic stress is never addressed, we do see in literature, 
it's going to compound. And that's when inflammation is potentially going to lead to more chronic diseases and, and things not working correctly in the body. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that, you know, heart disease is one of the things that I think about diabetes. Like those are all things that, um, and I don't, I don't want to say it's just inflammation and it's just mm-hmm. stress because um, there are other genetic proponents that go into it. But if if we're just like letting those stressors run haywire and we're never really addressing it or working to fix it, um, you would need to be like genetically really lucky to not have, you know, those awful feelings perpetuate and and it not lead to something potentially bigger. Yeah. And I think the thing that I think about too, that I'm constantly telling people is even like the psych component, like not dealing with stress and then it may be causing extra anxiety or depression. And then you can't do these healthy habits. Like I just feel like stress is the root of all evil. Oh my goodness. It's so true. Sometimes I'm like, okay, I'm so glad that everyone is like eating their salads, but like if you're stressed out at the end of the day, it doesn't even matter. Yeah. Um, And that's so true too. Like just from a behavioral standpoint, even like stepping aside with biology, you know, I I talk with people at the beginning about biology and how it works and I educate them and they find value in that. But then they know, once they know that they know that, you know, and I can reiterate those facts, but then it comes to like the behavior change side of things. And Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, if we are having lots of things in our life that are externally stressing us out, not only is that impacting us and how our body is responding, but then are we even able to like prepare the foods that we know we're going to nourish ourselves. Are we even going to be able to make time to go for a walk or go for exercise? Um, you know, don't let those stressors, you know, keep you from actually doing the behaviors that are going to get you to your goals. Yeah. So for some tangible things of what we can do to decrease the stress, uh, are there any certain like dietary patterns, eating plans, foods that are particularly effective in reducing bodily stress and inflammation? This was actually an audience question too. It it comes down to balance and it comes down to eating, I think, for what your body really truly needs and making sure that you're staying nourished. So it kind of comes back to the unglamorous side of things where it is making sure that you're getting in really rich, colorful produce. Um, That rich, colorful produce um, is going to be indicative that there's vitamins and minerals and polyphenols and antioxidants. They're going to help fight inflammation and give your body just the bare minimum to like repair itself. Right. Um, And also making sure that you're getting in adequate amounts of protein because protein is going to give your body those building blocks to create enzymes and and repair any sort of inflammation or damage. Um, Healthy fats as well, too. There's lots of studies that show that fatty fish, avocados, olive oil, those types of foods can help with decreasing inflammation systemically um, with those good omegas. Um, so yeah, but it comes back to getting that inconsistently, um, and having that balance every single day, you know, not just Mm -hmm. like eating one really, really fancy, vibrant, colorful, balanced meal on a Friday. And then like, you know, not consistently doing that. We need to give our body the fuel every single day, especially if we're trying to fight that chronic inflammation, right? It's, it's really important to, um, consistently nourish our bodies. Are there any foods that should be avoided? Yeah. I always like to focus on an addition, not subtraction. And I do think that there's a huge displacement theory, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're focusing on getting in the foods that are going to fight inflammation, there's a really good chance that maybe we won't necessarily have the appetite for those things. Um, I will say that though, that like, if your baseline is going to be a lot of refined, um, foods that aren't nutrient dense, Mm -hmm. you're putting yourself, you know, at a deficit already. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I don't want to say like stay away from all of those things because everything can can find its way into a balanced diet as long as that baseline is balanced and consistent. Yeah, no, it just sounds like I hear you saying like the majority of time, let's focus on these like good fats, this variety yep. of fruits and vegetables, good proteins, and we shouldn't yep. outright avoid the uh, processed foods or the refined foods, but maybe they shouldn't be the majority of what you're eating if you're trying to reduce absolutely. inflammation. Okay. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> you got it. What exactly. about... Uh, what about uh, food sensitivity tests? So I just want to throw this one in here because I don't know about you, but I'll randomly get these calls from people that are like, I took this food sensitivity test. Um, I'm trying to find a dietitian that will like work with me to make a meal plan out of it. And I'm like, what are these tests that I keep hearing about? What do you, what do you think about them? 
Yeah, it's interesting. I don't love them because I still think it sticks to the restrictive aspects, right? You're given a list of like foods like don't eat. And the rhyme and reason behind it is that they've like taken part of your blood and analyzed it for um, certain types of Ig. I think it's IgA and IgE antibodies. I may be, I may be wrong on that, but a specific type of antibody that shows that your body is having some sort of inflammatory marker when you eat food. It is highly debated throughout the medical and mm. dietitian world um, as to how accurate it is. Um, I have had people also come to me before and say, can we work on this? And sometimes it could be a good starting point, but not. I think it's just more of like the, the mindset that people go into. And I like to highlight, okay, well, you can have all of these foods. So let's eat all of these things. A lot of times it's like, stuff that, you know, we were just talking about the healthy fat, um, the good produce. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I am not, I am not going to sit here and be like, oh my gosh, you know, cabbage is the reason you're inflamed. (laughs) Like if this test comes back and says something really odd, like that's just, it's not the problem. Like there it's, it's bigger picture situation. Um, so I don't really like practice with those things at all. And maybe they'll find them themselves useful in the future if we can really nail down the science. But right now I do think that people really should just like work more so with medical professionals um, and with a dietitian in, in general, because really the gold standard is, is like, if you eat something and you feel awful afterwards, right. that's like the biggest indicator. Right, indicator. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about exercise? How does that impact inflammation stress, like good, negative or positive? Which one? Or like either way? Yeah. So I um, I recently read Mitochondria and the Future of Medicine by uh, Dr. Lino. I don't know if you're familiar. Um, and I was really intrigued to learn this. So he talks um, a little bit about the actual like cellular component of inflammation, like really looking like down to like just the mitochondria. Right. And I could really geek out about that. Um, but the, the, the way to the biggest takeaways is that all of our bodily systems have cells and they all have mitochondria. And, um, if our mitochondria is healthy and, and, you know, we're feeding our mitochondria, they're going to function well and give us longevity, less inflammation, et cetera. And they did talk a little bit about inflammation and how there is like inflammatory markers. And, um, there are some, um, I don't want to say like negative things that come with exercise by any means, but some inflammatory markers that can be present through any sort of exercise. Mm -hmm. Um, just because like we're putting our bodies through some stress, right. Any sort of physical movement is kind of like a stressor to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Um, but really, truly, if we're doing exercise, that's like not like really kicking our butts and like way out of like our comfort zone and we're not overly strenuous um, and we're like doing moderate physical activity on a consistent basis, um, even though there's maybe small amounts of inflammation that happen acutely, long term, having your cells be adapted to physical movement helps fight inflammation long term. So um in the moment, like, and I think about this, right? Like after you work out, you kind of get sore, right? Right. It, it's inflammation. It is. It's just how the body is responding. But the way that your body is rebuilding itself is going to be a lot stronger and a lot, um, it's going to be better off to fight inflammation and stressors. Gotcha. Okay. So you want to stress it a little bit, but not have it be in this like constant state of like stress from like all this crazy intense stuff. Yeah, absolutely. And I do think that physical activity is a great way to uh, overcome maybe some sort of like actual stressors, right? So Mm -hmm. a lot of times people say like, I'll go for a walk or I'll go work out whenever I'm feeling like overwhelmed with work. And that I think is a great behavior because you are setting yourself up for for, um, success long-term. Okay. What are your three biggest tips for how to reduce stress overall? And then I have some specific examples that I like want to ask you about, but you tell me your general top three tips. Okay. Okay. Um, so first and foremost, um, I think it's figuring out what's causing you stress, um, and being really super honest with yourself. Um, when we are able to name something and uh, like think about it specifically, like we are addressing it and that may look different than what you're expecting stress to be like, because there are even some good stressors 
but the way that they are impacting our body may not necessarily be healthy. So it's, it's having a real and honest conversation with yourself in a way that's non-judgmental, that's like, okay, this is, this is my stressor, right? And just understanding and knowing and having a relationship with it so you can actually take the steps, um, the, the steps to, to impact and improve it. Mm-hmm. Um, that's my, my first thing. And yeah. when I, when I work with people who like sometimes have to have like uncomfortable conversations with themselves, or even just like with me as brainstorming, they're like, oh, wow, like I didn't realize that that was stressing me out and I thought it was good. But now that I know, I can either approach it differently or I can find ways to improve, improve that stress overall. Um, So that's my first one, you know, identifying the stressor. Um, And then it sounds probably super silly um, and something that like is intuitive, but breathing is so important. Like, we obviously have to breathe to stay alive, mm-hmm. but a lot of the times when we are stressed, like we want to have some sort of reaction. It's actually very biological, right? Like, oh God, something stressing us out. Like we can go into fight or flight mode. And um, that's why it's good to identify what's causing that stress because then you can change your reaction, right? So like every every emotion that you're feeling is valid, but our reaction to it is the thing that can really like change the way that the stress is impacting us. And if we can go to breath work or doing some sort of breathing activity in that moment, it can really like help center us. And oxygen is like the thing that makes all of the cells and the mitochondria and like our heart pump and our lungs move and and, and the digestive tract go about. So, you know, breathing is going to be really uh, beneficial in that moment to, I think, get your mind right, but also like biologically provide your body with what it needs to endure that stress. And we do see that it can help bring cortisol levels down. It can supply oxygen where it's needed and then um, make that stress and inflammation a little bit less heavy hitting. You are like the fourth or fifth like practitioner I brought on that has talked about breathing. I feel like somebody out there needs, I guess you can't monetize on breathing. I don't know if they need to make a breathing app, but I've had a GI doctor, a therapist, a physical yeah. therapist, a trainer, and everybody, everything always comes back to breathing. So yeah, everybody needs to breathe. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. And I just, anyone who's listening, like if you think it's the silliest recommendation in the whole entire world, just like the next time you feel super stressed, like make yourself breathe ridiculously hard. And we can even, we can do an exercise if we need to. Um <laughs> about like how, how I kind of catch myself, um, you know, doing like three deep breaths in and then in and out, in and out. Um, and it, yeah, it sounds so ridiculous, but like it really, once you do it and you feel like the benefits, you're like, Oh, it does work. So, (laughs) Um, and then lastly, I really encourage people to carve out time to prioritize laughter and having fun in some sort of expressive way. I think that our culture, millennials in particular, like we go, 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 right? Like we live in a very high paced society. Um, We have high demands to be productive. And sometimes we forget like how important it is to giggle and how important it is to like express ourselves and our emotions. And obviously smiling is like, something that we want to do. But if you like catch yourself, like, oh, I'm super stressed because work is really like really getting the best of me and I'm staying up and and doing extra, or uh, there could be so many different situations. Like ask yourself, when was the last time you laughed? When was the last time you smiled? Um, and I, I've, I've been in these situations before when I, when I feel awful. And then when I ask myself that it's like, holy crap, I haven't like allowed myself to like have a little fun, um, in a couple of days. And that's, I'm probably feeling it. Um, and we do see that, that laughter, um, that expression, even like social interaction and hugs helps to bring stress levels down. So, um, can't monetize on hugs and and laughter either, just like breathing, but really important, really, really important things to do. These are so specific situations that I want to get your like quick and dirty, um, take on for stress. So a lot of people, are stressed about work. So what would you say to somebody who needs to reduce their stress at work? 
Something that I've seen be super effective for the people that I work with is excusing themselves for their lunch break. Mm -hmm. Um, So many times we want to work through it or we eat our lunch at our desk and we are really not removing ourselves from work stressors in general. And I do think that taking a moment throughout the day to break to breathe, to allow yourself some nourishment um, is going to help break it up in order to help you be more productive for the rest of the day, but also give yourself um, that that reduction. And I've, I've had people have tremendous success, even just digestive health too, right? They're taking themselves out of work and they're focusing on their meal and, you know, their meals digest better just because like they're not reading mm-hmm. their emails and getting stressed out because they have a deadline. They, they, it's out of sight, out of mind. Okay. Easy. Hopefully. Uh, what about, <laughs> uh, being a new mom or dad? So maybe you kind of speak to this, but I, whenever I get clients who are new parents, it seems like it's just like a whole new world of stress. They're not even used to. So what would you say about this? Yeah. Amen. Um, for those of you who don't know, I am a <laughs> new time mom. I have an 11 month old, um, my first daughter and it's, yeah, it's definitely been very different than anything I was anticipating. And I don't think anything could have prepared, um, me for it. And I will say the biggest recommendation I can have is like delegate mm-hmm. responsibilities. Um, you, if you have full-time work while you were a mom or a new parent, like it is two full-time jobs on top, on top of each other, There is a lot of demand and asking for help or even like paying someone to Mm -hmm. help you clean, to help you organize, to babysit in order to just get simple things done. Um, It may seem kind of silly and you may even beat yourself up like, oh, like I can't do it all. No, don't do that. You definitely need to offload on your partner or on a professional or on someone else in order to keep things straight that you value. Um, my example is I, you know, I have pretty bad OCD and I my house has to be in really good order in order for my brain to like really be able to relax and not be stressed. Um and for me to just complete my day-to-day activities with like grace and not be a, a crazy mess. Um And I never thought I would like hire a cleaning person on a consistent basis, but like they are my saving grace because like, I know that they're coming in my mind. I can kind of relax and be like, all right, if it's not perfect, it it will be. And um, just having that on a schedule, it's changed my life. (laughs) Totally. What about with health goals? So for people trying to start, sometimes I forget. Well, I don't even guess I know because I feel like I came out of the womb really loving like nutrition and health and stuff. But I see it a lot with people who maybe don't even know how to cook or are really stressed out with the thought of exercise. So what about somebody trying new health goals? How can they reduce stress? I have worked with one person in particular for years now. And we we say a lot of the times to rid yourself of the shoulds. Mm -hmm. And when we are on any sort of health or wellness journey, most of the time there is like, I should be doing this by this, or this should be what my weight loss journey is like, or I should be able to enjoy broccoli or salads. And that I think adds more stress because you are comparing yourself to, I don't even know what, um, but it's, it's making you feel less than, and I find that not only that does that discourage people, but it does, it stresses them out. Like they obsess over why they can't do what they think they should be doing or what they like, they're not doing what Gwen Paltrow is doing, right? So taking taking the shoulds away from it and being really gentle with your process, like mm-hmm. leaving those types of things out and allowing it to be a kind of trial and error. You know, don't don't overwhelm yourself with so many new health goals that like, you know, it's completely un, un, unachievable. Um, find things that are sustainable that really fit you in your life so you can work and step each day towards the right direction instead of just being like a quick fad. I like that. I like that. Uh, This is all such good information about stress, inflammation. What is one actionable tip that a listener can implement this week to reduce stress and improve their health? Um, So you can try bone bone broth if if you like. I don't yeah. think there's any harm in it. Um, I don't think you should do it the way that Gwyneth Paltrow does it because like drink bone broth, but also eat like a nourishing meal. Um, but I mentioned a little bit about like those those deep breaths. And um, it's funny because my daughter, uh, I listened to some of her like toddler baby music and they have like one song about like 
pause and take a belly breath and um belly breaths just sound very elementary but really that's what I would tell someone to do like to reduce stress when you feel like you were in a reactionary moment or like maybe your lid is flipped and that kind of stress that you know you can control and is in and around your environment um stopping and taking um a breath and as I mentioned I like to I, I don't know why I like to do like a set of three breaths. Um, but I typically like to breathe in, um, and I will do it for like, breathe in for like six seconds, pause, breathe out for six seconds. Um, and then another thing that has really been helpful sometimes when I want to be intentional, because sometimes my breathing's boring. So I'm like, I'll start it and then I'll forget, um, you know, and I'm like, Oh, I'm, I'm intentionally breathing. Um, but I have gone to yoga classes before and even talked with nurses who do this with like their cardiac rehab, um, patients like respiratory work, um, where they tell them like on the exhale, one, pretend like you're blowing out birthday candles. Mm -hmm. So it gives you like this, ah, just intention. Um, and then you breathe in and then you can hold for a few seconds. And then on your next exhale, pretend like you're fogging up a mirror. So, Mm -hmm. um, it's like the type of, um, exhale. And that, I think it changes, it changes like the rhythm of your breathing. It makes you a little bit more in tune and gosh, do you feel good afterwards? Yes. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Well, if somebody is so inspired by everything you said and they're like, yes, I want to work on stress. I want to work on inflammation. I want to work with Kirsten. Where can they find you at contact you work with you? Tell us. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, my practice is accepting new patients at the moment. Um, and you can find us at Keeks and dot co. So that's K E E K S and dot co. Our company is called Keeks and Co. And we are a private practice group of dietitians. Um, we are in network with Blue Cross Blue Shield and United Health, um, just because we do work a lot with, um, you know, specific chronic diseases and inflammation and stress and, uh, lifestyle and behavior change. So, um, we'd love to be able to help you out and, uh, yeah, look forward to potentially helping anyone who's listening. Yes. Well, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us today, Kirsten. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Isla. It was wonderful. Thank you so much for listening to the Millennial Nutritionist Podcast. For daily weight loss tips and nutrition information, you can find us on Instagram at the.millennial.nutritionist and on TikTok at millennial.nutritionist. If you find this information helpful, please subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend who needs encouragement on their health journey. See you in the next episode.